The Tom Woods Show, episode 1107. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Friends, my Away Carry-On helps make my travel a pleasure. It's super strong yet lightweight, and it's even got its own USB charger built in. I'm like the king of the airport with this thing. Take $20 off your suitcase order when you head to awaytravel.com slash woods and use promo code woods at checkout. Hello, everybody. Tom Woods here. Lou Rockwell returns to the show today. I'm telling you, I get so many requests. Why don't the two of you do a podcast together? Why don't you have Lou on more often? And of course, I would love to. I just don't want to inconvenience the guy, but I would love to talk to Lou as often as possible. And for those of you who don't know, Lou is, of course, the founder and chairman of the Mises Institute, which is such a great organization. All the right people hate it, so you know it's good. It is a resource like you wouldn't believe. Just the website alone is an amazing resource. But what the Mises Institute does in pushing forward Austrian economics with its scholarly journals and its scholarly conferences and its training programs for students, it is, for better or worse, responsible for making me who I am today. I cannot recommend the Mises Institute to you more highly. Lou is also, of course, the publisher of LouRockwell.com which I read every day. So I went to my supporting listeners, and well, by the way, I might also mention, Lou's just been around the libertarian movement for many years and was a close colleague of Murray Rothbard and was chief of staff to Ron Paul. So he knows everybody and he's done tremendous work. He's a great benefactor of mine personally and of the human race more generally. So I went to my supporting listeners in the Supporting Listeners Facebook group, which is one of the benefits you get, by the way, just one of the benefits you get when you join over at supportinglisteners.com. And I said, what would you guys like me to talk to Lou Rockwell about? And they all had you know, all these different possibilities. So I thought, I'm just going to talk to Lou about all kinds of things that you are going to find interesting. And to be able to pick the brain of somebody like this, who is as knowledgeable as Lou and as influential It's a great treat, and I'm really glad to be able to do it. Lou, welcome back to the show. Tom, great to be with you, as always. I asked people in my private group what I should talk to you about. They had a lot of suggestions, and some people said, just talk, you know, just riff, just see where (laughs) the conversation goes. I mean, we do have some good conversations, not all of which would be suitable for podcast episodes, let's say, (laughs) but there are a lot of times I hang up and I think, gee, that would have been a good episode. (laughs) But anyway, let's start with uh, just things going on in the world these days. We we're hearing now about steel and was it steel and aluminum? I forget what the other one was. But steel and aluminum. Yeah, steel and aluminum tariffs are on their way. And I guess we can't say we weren't warned about that. On the other hand, George W. Bush, I guess, was in favor of tariffs on steel as well. Yes, but, and in fact, his are higher than Trump's. 30% is versus 25%. But because he gave speeches in favor of free trade, he (laughs) gets off the hook or something. I don't know. Just crazy. But either way, regardless of that, it's still just a – it is a really wretched way of thinking. And the fact that the AFL-CIO is cheering it is almost all you need to know. On the other hand, so many bad guys are opposed to it that it almost – it throws me a bit, (laughs) to be honest. But what, have these people really learned economics? Not sure what's happening here. It's funny, Murray used to point out that the steel industry was the oldest protected industry in the country, uh, so, uh, 200, more than 200-year-old infant industry. Yeah, infant industry, right. That needed help and protection. Yeah. And uh, so it's, 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 it's a terrible thing. On the other hand, the U.S. is not exactly a pure free trade operation. We have many uh, tariff and non-tariff barriers and always have had them. So, uh, But, of course, adding – more tariffs, it's, it, it's a bad thing economically, it's a bad thing politically, it's uh, very unfortunate. It does appeal to his base, though, which won't see and, or understand the consequences elsewhere in the economy when prices are higher for certain goods. All they'll see, it's, it's the classic Bastiat thing, all they'll see is the steel industry jobs and the higher wages or whatever. That's what they'll see. They won't see anything else. No, it's true, and I and I noticed in Pat Buchanan's latest column uh, yesterday, talking about how evil it was to have given uh, tariff cuts to China, and uh, that's led to them becoming a monster, 
and they're going to take over the U.S., they're going to take over the world, and uh, you know, it's, it's a terrible thing. But, of course, he's part of that anti-free trade lobby. And a lot of what is called free trade is actually managed trade. I mean, they called NAFTA, the NAFTA treaty with Mexico and Canada, a free trade treaty. It was not a free trade treaty. It was a managed trade treaty. And uh, I'll never forget going down to in the days when you can only see the treaty at the uh, U.S. printing office in Washington and their other offices and seeing this gigantic two-volume thing, uh, thousands of pages, and so I, I spent some time looking at it, and it was nothing except special deals for big American companies and, of course, big Mexican and Canadian companies too. And this was not free trade. It was, it was uh, a, horrible, a horrible thing. So Trump is right to be against NAFTA, although given his record, he'll probably come out for NAFTA. But uh, he's right to have spoken out against it, to spoken out against TPP and these other managed trade treaties. Uh, but, of course— Tariffs of any sort are, are, are a bad thing. Now that we've talked about politicians, let's get away from that completely. <laughs> let's talk about a guy who is, just before our eyes, has just skyrocketed to unbelievable prominence in the world, and I mean Jordan Peterson. I've had him on my show twice, and he was already on the rise at that time, but I couldn't have predicted exactly where he was going to go or that he'd have the number one book on Amazon for weeks and weeks and weeks at a time. Something is going on beyond even him. In a way, he's he's like Trump in that he represents something that goes beyond just him, even though in Peterson's case, I mean, Peterson is much more impressive than Trump in a lot of ways, but he represents something. What is your impression of him and what do you think he represents? Well, I, I like him a lot. I think he's, of course, extremely articulate, ex extremely smart. But what I find qu quite wonderful and amazing is his, his appeal to young men. He's right that young men are being persecuted. Uh, all the public schools, for example, are anti-boy and are run by people who are uh, extreme feminists and, and uh, there are virtually no male teachers anymore, for example. Everything is, uh, everything is feminist. And uh, uh, it's true in colleges. Boys who go to college are constantly told for four years that they're part of the reason the world is such a mess. They're responsible for everything evil in the world, and they'd better, um, I don't know, give over their money and become a, some kind of a slave for uh, other groups. And it's had a bad, very bad effect on boys. And his, the appeal that he has to boys and young men is really something quite extraordinary, and he's doing it right. I mean, his 12 principles are excellent in his best-selling book, and he just is uh, uh, extraordinary. I, I wonder whether the University of Toronto will let him come back just because he's such, an, just such, a, such a star and such a star in the wrong way from their standpoint. But I think he's I think he shows us what can be done. It shows us what is being done by some people, I hope will be done by many more people. And uh, if anybody has not seen his interview with Kathy Newman, the British leftist, it's quite, it's quite, quite, a, quite an extraordinary event. It's on YouTube. I think it's had five or six million views. Uh, add yourself to it if you haven't seen it. Uh, so this guy is, is just unbelievably smart. And uh, I, I must say I don't think of psychology as a right-wing Operation, although in the past, like sociology, it was right wing, but of course it's been highly left wing for a very long time. It's, he's a professor of clinical psychology, who's had lots of experiences with individual patients, as well as as well as in groups, and now in humongous sized groups. And uh, I think he's helping to change the world. I think it's very very heartwarming and uh, thrilling that he's having the success that he is, and uh, it's great you've had him on your show. He's been on many important shows, and they can't get him. The left tries to trap him, tries to get They can't get him, uh, in part because he's right, in part because he's smarter than they are. And uh, I think it's one of the thrilling developments of our time, really something quite extraordinary and wonderful. And it's interesting that I mean, how unlikely that it would be a professor of psychology. <laughs> no? Isn't that interesting? From a very liberal university, too. Yeah, it just goes to show all we needed all this time was one person to stand up fearlessly. And also, it doesn't hurt to have brilliant things to say, but really, 
more than the brilliant things is just his willingness to say, I won't do it. But I shouldn't say maybe more than the brilliant things because, my gosh, have I seen testimonials from young men for whom the brilliant things mean everything, who say, he turned my life around, he helped me sort myself out, he helped me get grounded, he helped me get over a lot of my problems. and That's incredible, and it's just this one man and YouTube really against the world. And you know what's interesting, Lou? I had a chance to talk to, uh, let's say, a, a Republican group. I don't want to say exactly which one, but a, a fairly substantial Republican organization. And it was a pretty large audience. I was, uh, I was invited to address their dinner. And my policy is uh, I address any pretty much any dinner, just about any. If you're going to feed me a dinner, <laughs> I'll come address you. And I, I talked about Jordan Peterson a bit. Nobody knew who he was. I mean, that's how out of it the average, the rank and file of the GOP at this point, especially the silver hair types. No offense, I, I'm also one of those now, but they have no idea what's going on in in that. They they know that they know about trivial political things, but a major major cultural phenomenon. They had no idea. They were very glad to learn about him. But they had to learn about him from me. So I don't know what they're reading or <laughs> what is up with the conservative movement. They had no idea who Jordan Peterson was. And then likewise, recently I saw an old friend from college who's not a, you know, who's about my age, who's very, very mainstream Republican. No idea who Jordan Peterson was. This phenomenon is is crashing through society and is is affecting so many young men in so many positive ways. And they have no I, I found that was astonishing how out of it these people were. And, you know, Tom, speaking of standing up for the right, the way he first came to people's attention was his refusal to obey a new uh, Ontario law that said you that you had, it's, it's illegal not to use a transgender's or really anybody's preferred pronoun. And apparently there, uh, at, at the time this happened, there were 35 pronouns. I think now there's 60. And uh, he said he wouldn't do it. And, of course, they were threatening him with jail and uh, the university threatening to kick him out. But he just, he said, he said, uh, this is crazy. I'm, I'm not going to do it. And they told him, look, you just have to have your class list and you put the person's preferred pronoun next to them and then you're careful to, to use that pronoun if you don't say je or jour or whatever these other made-up words are. Uh, you're in trouble. And he said, that's, you know, that's <laughs> it's ridiculous. I'm not going to do it. And that is his refusal to go along with the latest hysteria in Canada, and of course it's we're not far behind here, um, made everybody stand up and take a look at him, either in hate or in uh, wonderment, and eventually in love. So uh, it's also he's I wouldn't say he's uh, typically religious, but he he's he is religious, and that's an important part of what he does. And of course that's something else you're not supposed to be uh, in these days. So. He's, um, yeah, he checks almost all the boxes. <laughs> You're going to have to tell me uh, off the air who this group was. Yeah, I will. I will. I guarantee you'll, <laughs> you'll know who they are. And I, and I actually said it because there, believe it or not, there really were some decent people in that audience. So I don't, I don't, I don't want to put the whole group down. Uh, it's just it, it astonished me how out of it they were that I was the one telling them about Jordan Peterson. <laughs> what news are you people reading? And whatever it is, it's <laughs> trivial. Um, and then also, I think I probably mentioned this on the show before, but he was on some television news program, like a like a discussion program in Canada, and it was most to the pe- most of the people on there were against him. But what I liked was that moment where he said, "You know, look at the you know cause, because the he- the host said to him." you do realize that this could mean really serious consequences for you. And he said, yes, I do. And then he said, but if they fine me, I won't pay. If they send me to prison, I'll go on a hunger strike. But I'm not doing it. Now that also, the fact that he would say that, it's not just I'm not doing it, but no matter what you bring against me, I will defy you. This is the opposite of what they want. They want to terrorize you into silence. They don't really (laughs) care if in in the depths of your heart, whether you really believe it. They want the outward conformity, and they want to terrify you into exhibiting it, and he can't be manipulated in that way. That's the amazing part about him. Well, as as you indicate, he's a very brave guy and extremely smart, uh, extremely right, and he, he, he definitely came along at the right moment. Yeah, exactly. Because I think in this country, too, um, he strikes a huge blow against 
transgender craziness and uh, political correctness in general. Yeah. In fact, how will you be able to tell the history of all this without mentioning his name? Forever, you know, in the future, looking back on this period and all and those phenomena, you'll have to mention the phenomenon of Jordan Peterson right alongside it. Now, likewise, when we look back at here's a ham handed segue, look at the libertarian movement, <laughs> it'll be hard not to mention the Mises Institute and LouRockwell.com. And I had somebody asking, uh, I'd like to hear about the rise of LouRockwell.com. Here it is, a you know, extraordinarily prominent and heavily trafficked libertarian website. That surely took some effort that's worth hearing about. And so I think people are just curious about the story of LouRockwell.com. And uh, are we are we close to the 20th year? Uh, we are. We're in the 19th year. And so, yes, one more year. And, and uh, uh, it, it all began when Clinton was bombing Serbia. And uh, I had a, a big Rolodex. And I started to send out things to people, e people's email addresses about against the war that Clinton was was running, and it got a good response from people, and it led me to think, well, really, I, I should have a website about this sort of thing, and uh, so I started the website, and and uh, I must say, it got pretty quick uh, positive response from people. Of course, it got I got hate mail and. Jonah Goldberg didn't like it, and you know other things that really struck in my heart. But um, <laughs> I, I think it. I, I think it, there was a place for it, and um, I, I should give credit to Drudge because I I was inspired by his old fashioned no change look to the site to his site uh, to design mine, and um, it's 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 gotten a good response. And so yes, it's it's 19 years old, and. Uh, I hear from a lot of young people, not Jordan Peterson-like, but uh, a lot of young people who uh, tell me they started reading it in high school, and it uh, had a good effect on their lives, so they so they felt. Yeah. So uh, it's been a lot of fun. I look forward to doing it every day, and um, I enjoy the emails I get. And I don't get that many hate mails anymore, which I don't know whether to feel bad about that or good about it. But it's it's uh, there are a lot of positive. A lot of people who like it of all ages, but especially young people. And um, I'm glad it's had – I think it's had a good effect. It's helped bring maybe Murray Rothbard to more people's attention. Not that he wasn't already very famous in libertarianism and, uh, and otherwise. Uh, so it's been it's, – I must say it's been a, a, a huge amount of fun. And uh, I'm very glad that it happened and, and uh, I'm glad it's still going. You know, I – when you said the thing about – hate mail, I made me think, you know, that's funny. I've gotten so little hate mail that I've actually forgotten all about the phenomenon of hate mail. I don't get it anymore <laughs> either. And I think at least, I don't want to speak for you, but in my case, I can say, it's because I think people have come to the conclusion that I'm too hopeless to be reached. It's not a good use of their time <laughs> to send me this email because it isn't going to change a thing. All right, we'll get back to my conversation with Lou Rockwell after we thank our sponsor. All right, folks, as I said, I am in New York City this week, and just take a wild guess at what I brought with me that made my life a lot happier. Well, of course, my Away carry-on. I love this thing. The four 360-degree spinner wheels make the thing practically float through the airport, not to mention it's super strong and yet lightweight. It's got a TSA-approved combination lock built into the top of the bag, and both sizes of the carry-on are able to charge all cell phones, tablets, e-readers, and anything else that's powered by a USB cord. And just last week when I was flying to Santa Barbara, I saw people huddled around one of these power stations at the airport where I had the layover, and they're huddled around, and there are three outlets, and they're all trying to plug something in. And I'm sitting there thinking, if only you had a beautiful away carry-on like I have, you wouldn't be desperately huddled around that power station like a salivating dog. For $20 off a suitcase, visit awaytravel.com slash woods and use promo code woods during checkout. That's $20 off a suitcase at awaytravel.com slash woods when you use promo code woods. Lou, we are coming up upon the, this is going to be this year, 2018. It's 25 years since I first came to a Mises Institute event. I can't believe that. 25 years, Lou. What is happening? <laughs> I went to the Mises University summer program. It was out at Claremont McKenna at that time. And it was just an, uh, I just cannot say enough about what a life-changing experience it was. I mean, I was already libertarian-oriented, 
but it really, really helped to make me who I became. I did go through my paleocon phase for a little while after that, but I more or less emerged from that and became a you know hardcore austro libertarian by the turn of the century. So I'm, you know, you, you of course were the are the founder and chairman, and um, we have talked a bit about the story of the Mises Institute, I think, in the past. But um, looking ahead, what would you like to see the Mises Institute do in the future? You know, I'm just going to reminisce for a moment about 25 years ago when you were at Claremont, and uh, I had talked to Murray Rothbard about the fact that you wanted to speak to him and were very much worth speaking to. And I said, um, I said, Murray, he's what you've always wanted. He's a top historian who knows economics. And Murray said, what? You know? <laughs> so I remember introducing the two of you in the, sort of the central area of the, of the Claremont campus. And um, I left you two talking. And more than an hour later, I came back by there. And you're still both of you just standing close to each other, just <laughs> talking, talking, talking. And that was so heartwarming. And I thought this is a very, very good development for libertarianism and uh, correct history and correct economics and so forth, as of course indeed it turned out to be. So I think the Institute has uh, it's been 35 years now. Um, I think we've uh, had a very good effect. Um, I know I, I won't mention who it was, but there's a so called libertarian economist who is not a fan of the Institute. And uh, he keeps saying, look, we can't use the, the words Austrian economics anymore because if you put that into Google, the Mises Institute comes up rather than our group. <laughs> and uh, and <laughs> so they've had three or four different name changes. And then, of course, they always come back to Austrian economics because that's the only thing about them that's interesting, uh, even if their uh, version of Austrian economics is uh, slightly warped. Um, so I think the sorts of things we're doing with young people, we've reached uh, – Tens of thousands of young people in, in serious ways, not only uh, through our programs and, and residence of the sort that you attended uh, twice, both as a, as a uh, at the uh, Mises University and also in our summer program, summer fellows program. Um, but I think we've just reached, especially probably in Eastern Europe, interestingly enough, the United States second, Western Europe next, Latin America, uh, Asia. So we keep seeing. For example, more and more Chinese students coming. Pappy Cannon, please forgive us. Uh, that's another terrible thing we're doing. So we have kids from – we've had a huge effect on Poland, for example. I mean there's a vast Austrian movement in Poland and uh, people ascribe their, uh, their refusal to go along with EU orders uh, to nationalism and that's part of it and to religion, that's part of it. Uh, but they also uh, – a tremendous number of young people in Poland understand economics. And they, a lot of those key people were without a doubt trained at the Mises Institute because I got to know them when I was there. That's – you know, that's true. So um, we want to keep bringing in young people. One thing we would like to do – and this is something that Guido Holzman worked on when he uh, spent several years with us some time ago. Uh, we can't give degrees. The state makes it impossible in terms of – the amount of money and hundreds of thousands of library books you have to have and this sort of thing. Uh, we've got a very large library. We've got about 45,000 books. It's a uniquely uh, magnificent Austrian and libertarian library, but it would not uh, – so we'd have to have much bigger – we'd have to have many more faculty. We'd have to have tenured faculty, all kinds of uh, regulations. So we can't do that, but we did think that it's possible for us to have a structured program of giving – Maybe we'd call them licentiates. Maybe we'd call them certificates. Uh, and we can't, it can't be a bachelor's, a master's, or a PhD. Uh, but other kinds of degrees are open to us. And we think that uh, not only would students be interested in this, but there are plenty of people on Wall Street and in, in their careers otherwise who would find it a good thing on their resume and also, of course, a great thing for their mind to do some serious study of Austrian economics and to get recognition of that. Uh, where we'd have exams and so forth. So this is something I would very much like to see in the future to increase increase the number of people, smart people interested in Austrian economics. And I think the whole, Jordan Peterson is showing this, in, uh, the whole typical university system I think is cracking. I mean, when you think of what the top universities in this country and the top colleges seem to have gone insane, how much longer are boys, for example, going to go to college? 
if they're being nothing but uh, denounced and smeared and libeled for a lot of money for four years by a bunch of left-wing boobs. So I think that there may be uh, other sorts of structures that can come up. I think the Mises Institute can play a very important role in this. And alternative structures of higher education be a lot cheaper than, of course, what they're doing. And uh, so that's that's sort of my that's my secret dream for the Mises Institute that we would become, in effect, not really a university. I mean, that's that's has a specific meaning, but um, a high, an institution of higher learning, much cheaper than the others, much more effective, and uh, I think much more powerful. So I, I I look forward to a lot of the bricks and mortars crumbling, and I think that. Um, there are libertarian ways to do these things, to circumvent them, and to provide what people need and want. Uh, and, of course, it could be broader than Austrian economics, be history and uh, philosophy and, and other areas, too. So that's, uh, that's one thing I'd like to see. Lou, I rather suspect you're not particularly fond of the term liberty movement, but you know what's meant by it. What would you say is your sense of where it stands right now as compared to, let's say, where we were in 2011 when when Ron was in the heat of his second campaign, second Republican campaign? Well, I'm afraid we've um, retarded. I think that um, the, left, the, the left-wingism has not only taken over universities and colleges, it's made huge inroads into the, into the uh, libertarian movement or the so-called liberty movement. And... Um, they're all ultra-PC. Recently, uh, the Libertarian Party announced to Ron Paul that if he wanted to come to speak at their convention, they weren't going to allow him to. Yeah. So that's – then they backed down. They said, well, of course, we didn't really mean it. He can, he can speak. Um, but they hate Ron Paul. They hate what he stands for. Uh, there was a guy at um, the Cato Institute, not Ed Crane – who when Ron was running for the Libertarian Party nomination said, uh, he said, look, he's no good. He's too, he's too white. He's too straight. He's too middle class. So this kind of stuff has been around for a very long time. And that was in 1987. And um, I'm afraid it's, it's metastasized. So there's still a lot of good people in the Libertarian Party and the, in the outreaches in places like Texas and so forth. But the, the, the Washington movement of all sorts, uh, which is pretty much uh, the, the Koch movement, Cato, Reason, and et cetera, the Libertarian Party allied with them. Uh, they're all leftists, and they're all bitter leftists, and uh, they really are not that much different from the kind of people that Jordan Peterson is fighting at the University of Toronto. We're just slightly behind, if that's the word, uh, their progress. On the other hand, the ideas of liberty are so powerful and so true and so just so attractive that I think, and of course we keep having more and more young people come up, and I think they're not as not poisoned by leftism like an older generation. So I have great optimism for the future, but I think it's going to be a few years before we're back to where we were in the days of Ron Paul. Somebody else wanted to know, and I think we'll we'll probably wrap up with this. What is your opinion on the question of whether in addition to the non-aggression principle, in order for liberty to be successful and sustainable, it's necessary for people to have additional ideas, whether about gender or family or tradition or whatever. Well, I think it's true. Uh, I think it's obviously true. Um, non-aggression axiom is, is, uh, is a political uh, statement. But as Murray Rothbard always said, you have to have a lot more than than politics, you have to have ethics and religion and history and uh, many other things. So um, I, I, I've come to dislike the word gender. I must say, I, I, they're just two sexes. They're, you know, gender has to do with French, the French language or whatever. Uh, but it's, it's. Uh, I think that uh, we have to have a culture. That there's no question that I think. Uh, I mean, I am a thin libertarian in the sense that I think libertarianism is is just the non-aggression principle in one sense. Uh, but I think Hoppe is right that there are certain cultural norms that provide a better ground for libertarianism to grow in. And certainly leftism is anti-libertarian. And no matter how much they try to claim that we, you know, to be a libertarian, you have to be a feminist, you have to be all the, all the rest of the, uh, 
the politically correct groupings. You have to support those, and you're not a libertarian if you don't. Uh, also, these people tend not to be in favor of the non-aggression principle. I think not uh, not exactly unusual because they're all for civil rights laws. <clears throat> they're all for finding and jailing people for having the wrong views in their in their eyes on race or sex or um, many other many other things. So I think Bionic Mosquito, for example, the, the the blogger does a lot of work on this. But clearly, there are well, as Lord Acton said, that liberty was the key political end of of, uh, of of life. But of course, as he said, that's not the only thing there is. Rothbard held exactly the same views. And uh, in fact, I, I, I've often thought there, were, there was a uh, traditional mass chapel opening in Las Vegas um, shortly before his death. And he told me he was interested in checking it out. So I've always thought that maybe that meant that Murray was... was uh, having religious interests, too. I think there were other, some other indications of that towards the end of his life. Um, but there's many more things. There is family, society, just 101 other things besides libertarianism. On the other hand, libertarianism is, is, is essential to a free society and to a decent society and to a healthy society, but it's not sufficient. So I think that um, – I do think we need more than that, but of course – as libertarians, we should be concentrating on libertarianism, which doesn't have properly thought of, uh, which doesn't exactly uh, uh, overwhelm with with uh, sponsors and uh, adherents. But it is the correct idea. We have a tremendous uh, legacy of, of uh, great thinkers and genius thinkers, not only Mises and Rothbard, but and Acton and and uh, Reiko and 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 so many others. Uh, we have a, a burden on us to carry this forward, but it's not all there is in life. There's music. I mean, there's many, many, many different things that uh, that are also so important. Lou, I want to, uh, of course, urge people who have not done so yet to go to Mises.org. We have a lot of people go to LouRockwell.com. Um, if you're not one of those people, you've got to do that because that's how you start your day. Then, then you go check Mises.org, and if you go to Mises.org, you could potentially never come back because of <laughs> everything that's there. You just, if you really look around, you're going to say, "Oh my gosh, this is all I need. I, I don't need one other thing," as Steve Martin said in The Jerk. I don't need one other thing. So, uh, it's I know I know a young guy who had to spend a year at home, and so what he did was he listened to everything on the Mises site. <laughs> Which he said it, he didn't actually get to it all in a year. Yeah, but it, uh, he said it changed his life, and he was very grateful for it. It's it's incredible. I mean, it's it's courses, it's it's articles, it's books, it's entire print runs of scholarly journals that are of tremendous significance in the history of the libertarian movement. Almost anything you could think of is over there at Mises.org. And then, uh, again, for, for really terrific commentary, of course, you've got LouRockwell.com. These are indispensable to me and so important to me, and they really help me clarify my thinking. Sometimes there'll some issue will come up, and I don't automatically know what the right way to think about it is. Sometimes I need some input from friends and I look at these sites, and they help me clarify my thinking. It's really, really important. I hope everybody will support both of these things, too. It's nice to visit them, but it's, it's uh, also important to support things we believe in so that we can say, as libertarians, that we really mean it when we say that civil society will be able to support itself because we will all support things that we cherish. Well, go ahead and do it. And two really, really <laughs> worthy things are lourockwell.com and mises.org. Uh, Lou, I am thinking I may come to the conference later this month, so Tremendous. presumably I'll see you then. We'll roll out the red carpet. Ah, uh, thanks. Okay, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Tom. All right, folks, here's something you're going to find very interesting. Before I let you go, I need to tell you about a listener of this show who runs a practice. He's a physician. He runs a practice primarily for treatment of opiate dependency. And he's been influenced by the Tom Woods show, he says, in two particular ways. He says, number one, I set up a direct patient pay model so I could care for patients directly. He says he was inspired after hearing Dr. Josh Umber on episode 481 of this show, one of the best episodes ever, because it really gives you some insight into what genuine free market medical care would look like and how inexpensive it would be. So he's adopted that model for his practice 
Secondly, he says another influence on the practice was another of your guests, Johann Hari. I've recommended his book and your interview with him to many on the sources of addiction. So very interesting. The website for the practice is paladincenterleads.com. Leeds, L-E-E-D-S, for Leeds, Massachusetts. Paladincenterleads.com will give you the information you need if that is something you want to look into. I will link to this also, as the listener website mentioned, on today's show notes page, which is tomwoods.com slash 1107. Now, if you would like to get this kind of publicity for your website, make sure you get your hosting before you create that site through my link, and you'll get this plus uh, several other very, very valuable bonuses. So check out how to get those bonuses over at tomwoods.com slash publicity. And tomorrow we're going to be talking with a school teacher who chooses to remain nameless, who is speaking out against the student walkouts, all the whole the whole walkout culture that is in favor of gun control as the solution to the gun violence in the schools. So we're going to talk to him tomorrow. I'll see you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.